So in this video, we're going to be talking about uniform circular motion, which, as you can probably guess, it's when something is moving in a circle. And so the, the special thing about uniform circular motion, the uniform means that the object is moving at a constant speed. However, even though the speed is constant, as you can see here, the velocity vector is always tangent to the circle. So the velocity vector is always tangent to the path of the object. Well, that means as the object is moving around the circle, then the velocity vector is always changing direction. So the velocity is changing direction, but not magnitude. Remember, the magnitude is the speed. So if it's changing direction, then there still must be an acceleration. So we have an acceleration on the object that is changing the velocity's direction, but not its magnitude. So whenever we have that, then we know the acceleration must be perpendicular to the velocity. Because if an acceleration is perpendicular to a velocity, then it only changes the direction, not the magnitude of velocity. So we must have some sort of acceleration pointing towards the center of the circle. Because, you know, that's the direction in which the velocity vector is trying to sort of turn. And it's perpendicular to the velocity vector. And if you don't believe me that accelerations perpendicular to the velocity don't change the magnitude, well, we can see this by, by using the dot product. So remember that the dot product of a vector with itself is equal to its magnitude squared. So the speed squared is equal to the velocity vector dot product itself. So then we can ask, what is the derivative of the speed squared? So then we use the product rule to differentiate the dot product. And so we find that it's equal to 2 times the velocity dot the acceleration. And so if the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity vector, then their dot product must be zero. And so if their dot product is zero, then this derivative is zero, and therefore, if the speed squared is not changing, then ni neither is the speed. So we just proved that if velocity is perpendicular to acceleration, the speed is not changing. So this acceleration is called the centripetal acceleration. So when an object is moving in a circle, at a constant speed, then its acceleration is equal to its speed squared divided by the radius of the circle. And so the centripetal acceleration, as we said before, it always points towards the center of the circle. And it changes the direction, not the speed of the velocity. So well, if there's an acceleration, then there must be some associated net external force that's causing the acceleration. And so we call this the centripetal force. It is the net force on an object moving in a circle. Now it's very important to note that the centripetal force is a net force. So all sorts of forces can combine to make this centripetal force. The centripetal force is not a specific force. It can be many things in many different situations. For example, for planets moving around the sun, the gravity is the centripetal force that keeps them in orbit. If you're twirling around a ball on the end of a string, then the tension in the string is the centripetal force that's keeping the ball moving in a circle. Let's say that you have a car moving in a circular turn, then you know, the friction on the road might be the centripetal force. So again, the centripetal force is a net force, not some specific force. So another new term we have is the period, and this is the time it takes for the object to complete one round around the circle. We can easily find an expression for this. Since we know the speed is distance over time, well then, how long does it take to go one round? Well, one time around the circle, is uh, the distance is going to be the circumference of the circle. 
which is 2 pi times the radius. So it goes the circumference distance in the period time. So the period is going to be equal to the, the circumference divided by the speed of the object. So to end, we're going to look at one short example of circular motion. So here we have a roller coaster loop and there's this guy going around and around the loop. So we want to know what is the normal force on him at the top of the loop and the bottom of the loop. So first we have to identify the, the forces on him. So there's always gravity pointing downwards and then there's the normal force from the seat of his roller coaster. So at the bottom of the loop the normal force is pointing up you know, because his seat's upright but at the top of the loop, the normal force is pointing downwards because he's upside down. So you can see that the at the top of the loop, the normal force and the gravity combine to make the centripetal acceleration, whereas at the bottom of the loop, they're acting in opposite directions. So just by looking that at this, we can guess that at the top of the loop, the normal force must be less than at the bottom of the loop. Because if the normal force was always the same, then he would have a much higher centripetal force at the top of the loop than at the bottom. So at the top of the loop, we know the, the net force is always equal to m times a, and in circular motion, the centripetal acceleration we know is the speed squared over the radius. And I'm just going to v from now on, so I don't have to keep drawing the absolute value sign. So the, at the top, the normal force and gravity are acting together, so they're both positive. We take positive to be towards the center of the circle in this situation, not doesn't matter up or down. So then we can, we can just solve for the normal force here. And then at the bottom, it's the same thing, except now we're going to have n minus mg. The normal force is acting towards the center of the circle, and gravity is acting away from the center. So now we have an expression for the normal force at the top and the bottom. And as we predicted, at the bottom, the normal force is more than at the top because it's plus mg plus something else. However, note that the centripetal force, even though the expressions are different, they are the same. Because as long as the speed and the radius of the circle are the same, then the centripetal force must stay the same. So the net force in the direction of the center of the circle is always staying the same as long as the object is a constant speed. Okay, so lastly, let's look at how fast the roller coaster would have to be going in order for the guy to be weightless at the top of the loop. So remember that weight is determined by the normal force that you feel. So if the guy is weightless at the top, that means there is no normal force acting on him. So the only force on him at the top of the loop would be the force of gravity. Then he would be weightless at the top. So we can just solve for the speed here. And so we see that if his speed was the square root of the radius times g, then he would be weightless at the top of the loop. And you can find the normal force that would have to be acting at the bottom of the loop if he was going this fast. And you can see that it's equal to 2 times mg.